Senators, I rise today as the opposition critic to speak to second reading of Bill C-40, the Miscarriage of Justice Review Commission Act, which would create a body to review and investigate potential wrongful convictions. Before I begin with the substance of the legislation, I wanted to address how difficult it has been to get answers from the Trudeau government about this bill. I asked Department of Justice officials questions at my critics briefing on this bill three weeks ago and still have not received full answers to some of my questions. I received only a couple of minimal answers by email. I asked the sponsor of Bill C-40, Senator Arnott, questions after his relatively brief speech three weeks ago, but I finally received those answers just a few hours ago today. Unfortunately, these answers are not especially responsive. I am certain this is not the fault of Senator Arnott, but instead it is the fault of the Trudeau government, who is supposed to provide him with those answers. And this fake feminist Trudeau government lauds itself as providing a gender-based analysis plus or GBA plus document for every bill. But this government document has not been posted online on the government's website or on the parliamentary legislation portal, nor was it provided as part of the government's briefing to senators on this issue. I had to request a copy from Senator Arnott, and I do thank him for ensuring I received that earlier this week. But all of this illustrates a larger problem in Trudeau's independent Senate. There is no connection between senators sponsoring government bills and the government caucus. The Senate government leader is allowed unlimited time to present a significant detailed speech prepared by the government to give senators an opportunity to hear the rationale behind the major policy supporting the legislation. Sadly, it has become commonplace for the Senate government leader and his Trudeau government Senate caucus to refuse to speak on government legislation before the Senate. Senator Gold has not given any second or third reading speeches yet since we returned last month. Therefore, senators also do not have the opportunity to ask questions to the government about these government bills. Instead, senators are left to only ask questions to an independent senator sponsoring the bill. Too many times, no answers are given to even basic questions about a bill. There is also no real accountability process for us to get the answers from bill sponsors. Independent senators too often make merely brief sponsor speeches at second and third reading. The speeches are sometimes so lacking in detail that senators cannot extract enough for robust debate. There was a time in the not-so-distant past when the Senate had significant and substantive debate on government legislation. Now we usually see sponsor speeches that are 15 minutes at most. One government bill sponsor last week spoke for only seven minutes at second reading and only three minutes for third reading. Yet the government demanded the Senate pass the bill in only two days from introduction to royal assent. Independent senators sponsoring government legislation have even delivered their speeches in the chamber before they've been briefed on the bill. Some sponsors have refused to answer questions. Meanwhile, critics of bills are told we need to hurry up and give our speeches so we can get the bill into committee and passed. That is not good governance. That is not good parliamentary debate. And that is not sober second thought to ensure that bills are tested and well considered to be the best that they can be for the benefit of Canadians. Turning to the substance of this bill then, Bill C-40 creates an independent commission to review and investigate alleged mis miscarriages of justice. The Commission will have the ability to refer the matter back to the courts for a new trial. The Commission will take the place of the Minister's current role to review an application and order an appeal based on a potential miscarriage of justice. Bill C-40 broadens and clarifies potential applicants, including those convicted under the Young Offenders Act and the Youth Criminal Justice Act, those not criminally responsible, and those who have received pardons or an absolute or conditional discharge. The bill ensures that the applicant and the relevant provincial attorney general are both notified of the admissibility of an application. Further, in the interest of transparency, the bill stipulates that the Commission must publish its decisions online. The short title of this bill is David and Joyce Milgard's Law. I'm sure most Canadians will know the reference to the Milgard case. David Milgard was a 16-year-old from Winnipeg. Wrong, wrongfully convicted of the 1969 rape and murder of Gail Miller, a nursing aide in Saskatoon. Milgard spent more than 22 years in prison for crimes he didn't commit. He steadfastly maintained his innocence, even though he recognized that without an admission of guilt, parole was unlikely. Violently abused in prison, Milgard made several suicide attempts. He escaped twice. 
For more than 22 years, his mother, Joyce, advocated tirelessly for the overturning of David's conviction. She rallied others in support of her son's cause, mounting a public crusade for her son's innocence. The Millgards applied to Justice Minister Kim Campbell for a wrongful conviction review in 1988. In 1991, Joyce Milgard even spoke briefly with Prime Minister Brian Mulroney on a street in Winnipeg to plead her son's case. I remember that well, as that meeting happened when I was just beginning my first year of law school at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. We even studied the Milgard case in my first year criminal law class that semester. Justice Minister Kim Campbell eventually referred the Milgard matter to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court recommended setting his conviction aside, and Milgard was released from prison in 1992. Minister Campbell ordered a new trial. However, the Saskatchewan government did not do this, instead staying the proceedings against Milgard without proclaiming his innocence. Joyce and David Milgard continued their fight to clear David's name. In 1997, DNA evidence from the clothing of murder victim, Larry, sorry, of murder victim Gail Miller was tested. It exonerated Milgard and led police to convicted rapist Larry Fisher. Fisher was charged with and stood trial for Gail Miller's rape and murder. My husband Dave Batters attended part of that Fisher trial in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, where Al Johnston so expertly led the prosecution of Fisher. A jury convicted Larry Fisher of Miller's rape and murder in 1999, 30 years later. In 2003, the Saskatchewan government initiated a formal inquiry into David Milgard's wrongful conviction. Years later, I worked as the Chief of Staff to Saskatchewan Justice Minister Don Morgan, and I served in that position in the fall of 2008, when Minister Morgan released the results of that Milgard inquiry. I even had the honour of meeting Joyce Milgard before the press conference that day. One of the recommendations of the Milgard inquiry was the creation of an independent commission to review wrongful convictions, similar to the entity proposed in Bill C-40 before us today. The creation of a criminal case review commission was contained in former Trudeau Justice Minister David Lamenti's 2019 and 2021 mandate letters. In March 2021, Minister Lamenti announced the appointment of two retired judges, the Honourable Harry S. Laforme and the Honourable Juanita westmoreland Traore to conduct consultations on the creation of a Criminal Case Review Commission. They, they released a report at the end of that process containing recommendations for the structure and function of an independent commission. The Trudeau government failed to follow several of the report's recommendations, but I will address that in more detail later. First, let's review the structure of the commission Bill C-40 does establish in this bill. Under this new regime, the Miscarriage of Justice Review Commission would consist of a full-time chief commissioner and four to eight other full or part-time commissioners appointed by the Governor and Council on the advice of the Minister of Justice. No less than one-third of the commissioners, including the chief commissioner, but no more than half of the commissioners must be lawyers with at least 10 years' experience in criminal law. Bill C-40 mandates that the other half of the commissioners must not, if possible, be criminal lawyers with 10 years' experience. I must say, I find the insistence on non-lawyers really surprising for a Justice Review Commission with investigative powers that can refer cases back to the courts for an appeal or a new trial. In this chamber Tuesday night, Senator Delfont confirmed that under the current system, the Criminal Conviction Review Group within the Department of Justice that reviews those cases sent to the Minister of Justice are in fact all lawyers. This is important given the severity of what we are dealing with here. One reason the Trudeau government gives for its new commission structure is ostensibly to address overrepresentation of certain groups in the criminal justice system. Yet I also note that Bill C-40 does not include the recommendation from the judge's report that one-third of the commissioners should be drawn from these populations, including Indigenous peoples and black persons. The bill only says that the minister must, quote, take into account factors such as overrepresentation, gender diversity considerations, etc., when considering appointments to the commission. In any case, the commissioners serve rather lengthy seven-year terms, which can also be renewed. The bill states commissioners can be removed, quote, for cause, a high standard, and it fails to de detail precisely how that process would work. Quorum consists of half the commission's members, but Bill C-40 does not state whether that quorum would need to include the chief commissioner or even any lawyer commissioners. 
In fact, Bill C-40 leaves quite a few details undefined. For example, the bill mandates that the timeline for the Commission to handle applications is, quote, as expeditiously as possible, but it fails to define any parameters for what that means. Secondly, the bill states that applicants must be updated on their applications, quote, on a regular basis. Again, the bill does not define the term regular basis, which may lead to confusion. Bill C-40 creates the position of a victim services coordinator, but doesn't indicate whether that will be a full or part-time employee or a contracted position. It also does not stipulate the pay of the chief commissioner and the other commissioners, only indicating the compensation will be, quote, fixed by the governor and council, that is, cabinet. Earlier today, I finally received this minimally responsive government prepared answer to the question on compensation I asked Senator, Senator Arnott three weeks ago. Quote, the salary range minimum is between 180,500 minimum and the maximum is 464,800. The salary range for the other four to eight commissioners will use the same 2024-2025 compensation for the GC group but beginning and ending at lower levels, unquote. This is a range of $284,000. Bill C-40 also does not indicate how many commissioners should be bilingual or hear, hear cases in both official languages. And while the bill indicates all Canadians should have easy access to the Commission, it doesn't provide details or resources for facilitating communication with Canadians from northern and remote communities. Furthermore, the bill does not provide details on how the Commission is to refer questions regarding an application to a Court of Appeal for a decision, or what the Commission is to do with the Court's response. Here's another so-called answer prepared by the Trudeau government that I received today, three weeks later. My questions to Senator Arnott were, quote, how long will it take before this Commission can start its work? Will it be months? Will it be years? What's the anticipated time frame, unquote? The government prepared answer, quote, after the passage of Bill C-40, initial startup will require the hiring of the chief commissioners, commissioners, staff, and the establishment of buildings or a basis of operation. As well, the commission will need to establish internal policies, practices, and engage with stakeholders to establish protocols, unquote. So, no time frame stated. You'd think if the government is going to take three weeks to get the Senate critic of their bill an answer, they could at least try to respond to the question. Getting back to other concerns I have with Bill C-40, while the Commission can suggest an appeal to court, it does not have the power to refer an applicant for a pardon or record suspension, as the original judge's report had recommended. Bill C-40 states that the Minister must take into account, quote, the overrepresentation of certain groups in the criminal justice system, unquote, but it only specifically names Indigenous and Black offenders. The charter statement the government provided on this bill is fairly scant, as is its gender-based analysis plus document. Oddly, the gender-based analysis plus document doesn't have that much to say about women. The document is silent on even basic statistics about the percentage numbers of women who are victims of crime, though it lists similar numbers for other specific groups. Senator Arnott stated in his second reading speech that of the 30 out of 200 cases over the last 20 years that were referred back to the courts for wrongful convictions, none were women. He noted that this meant women as a group were being underserved by the current wrongful conviction system. The gender-based analysis document doesn't even state how many women are convicted in Canada. Honourable Senators, even a quick Google search determines that in fact women comprise only 6% of federal offenders in Canada. So how many applications would we expect from that group? The factors that bring vulnerable Canadians into contact with the criminal justice system are many, varied and complex. Especially given that it is Mental Illness Awareness Week and today is World Mental Health Day, I particularly want to draw this Chamber's attention to the dismissive wording in the Trudeau government's GBA Plus analysis about Canadians with mental illness. It says, quote, According to the 2012 Canadian Community Health Survey, Canadians with a mental health or substance use issue are 10 times more likely to come into contact with police for problems with their emotions, mental health or substance use, and four times more likely to be arrested than Canadians without such an issue, unquote. Problems with their emotions and mental health and, quote, more likely to be arrested? This language trivializes the experience of people with mental illness 
and promotes harmful stereotypes linking mental illness with criminality, a stigmatizing trope I have fought against for years as a mental health advocate. In many ways, this bill creates a host of new questions. Why, for example, did the Trudeau government opt to lower the threshold required for finding of a miscarriage of justice? Currently, the Minister of Justice may order a remedy if he or she is, quote, satisfied that there is a, quote, reasonable basis to, to conclude that a miscarriage of justice likely occurred, unquote. Bill C-40 contains a much lower standard where the Commission will have to determine if they have, quote, reasonable grounds to conclude that a miscarriage of justice may have occurred and considers that it is in the interests of justice to do so, unquote. Again, the bill fails to define the, quote, interests of justice, nor does it indicate what possible scenarios might require an appeal due to a possible miscarriage of justice, but would not serve the interests of justice. Furthermore, Bill C-40 was originally drafted to require that all appeals must be exhausted. However, Liberal government MPs at the House of Commons Justice Committee amended the provision so that, in fact, this commission will no longer be a last resort and that all appeals do not necessarily have to be exhausted. So, applicants could apply directly to the commission if they receive a court outcome they don't like. Rather than having to apply to the, to the Court of Appeal, likely a more expensive route for an accused. After promising a commission on wrongful conviction since 2019, after years of consideration, the government drafted C40 to require exhausting all appeals. Then Minister of Justice Lametti spoke in favour of that requirement in his second reading speech. He stated unequivocally, quote, it is important to note that the miscarriage of justice review process is not an alternative to the justice system, nor it is an nor is it another level of appeal. Rather, it provides a post-appeal mechanism to review and investigate new information or evidence that was not previously considered by the courts." Unquote. His successor, Minister Varani, also testified in favour of that requirement at the House of Commons Justice Committee. When asked if he was concerned that this bill would, quote, open the floodgates of new and unwarranted applications, Minister Varani replied, quote, there are built-in factors to avoid them getting all the way through the floodgates. You still need to meet the threshold criteria. You need to have exhausted your appeals, at least to a court of appeal, or in some instances, all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, unquote. So if the requirement to exhaust appeals was a safeguard against frivolous or baseless applications, why would the government remove it? The Trudeau government and its justice minister will need to justify that. In his speech to the House of Commons, Justice Minister Lametti said that from 20, 2003 to 2023, a period of 20 years, the justice minister received only 187 applications in total. Under the Miscarriage of Justice Review Commission created by this bill, the Trudeau government anticipates 250 applications per year. That will be a huge jump. If the Commission doesn't grant one of the only two possible remedies, either a new trial or hearing, or referring the case to a Court of Appeal, then the Commission must dismiss the application. Again, Bill C-40 contains no provision allowing the Commission to recommend a pardon or a record suspension. This Miscarriage of Justice Review Commission should remain an extraordinary remedy. If this Commission recommends many new trials before cases have completed all available appeals, the Trudeau government's court delay crisis will only be worsened by a deluge of cases in the system. Compounding this problem, the Trudeau government has been utterly negligent in appointing judges in Canada. I've sounded the alarm on this for the last eight and a half years. These appointments are solely under the control of the Trudeau government, yet they still can't get a handle on this. The number of judicial vacancies peaked to outrageous levels under Justice Minister Lametti, but the number continues to be stubbornly high. This month, it is still at 52. Last year, Chief Justice Richard Wagner of the Supreme Court of Canada even took the extraordinary measure of writing Prime Minister Trudeau, calling the current situation, quote, untenable. He warned that judicial vacancies are contributing to the court delay crisis that can lead to the release of dangerous criminals and undermine confidence in the justice system. He said, quote, we are seriously concerned that without concrete efforts to remedy the situation, we will soon reach a point of no return in several jurisdictions. The consequences will generate headlines and will be serious for our democracy and all Canadians, unquote. 
If the Trudeau government truly wants to prevent the miscarriage of justice in this country, they should get appointing judges to fill courtrooms and ensure that justice can be served. In closing, Bill C-40 gives a commission the power that currently belongs to the Minister of Justice with the objective of making the process faster and more efficient. This is a laudable aim, particularly when we can consider the immense suffering of people like David Melgard, people who have been deprived of their freedom and potentially spend decades of their lives wrongfully imprisoned for crimes they did not commit. No one wants to, be, no one wants to see innocent people found guilty. Clearly, Canada has a duty to rectify these situations as expeditiously as possible. My major concern with this legislation is that Bill C-40 is short on details and leaves many questions unanswered. Further, I find the Trudeau government's lowering of the threshold for determining a wrongful conviction to be ill-considered. It may ultimately lead to a host of problems the government has failed to anticipate. Clearly, Bill C-40 will require close scrutiny in committee, and as Deputy Chair of the Senate Legal Committee, I intend to make sure it gets it. Our goal in the Senate should be to make bills the best that they can be. Thus, I hope all Senators will join me in carefully reviewing this legislation before passing it through this chamber. Thank you.